Hello again, everybody. Uh, on behalf of LEAF and our guest speaker for this evening, I want to welcome you all to the virtual Laycox uh, Park Tree Tour and express my absolute joy in having you join us this evening. My name is Lam and I'm the Education Coordinator at LEAF. We're a nonprofit based in Toronto that's dedicated to improving the urban forest in the GTA. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the organization, we help residents plant the right tree uh, in their backyard space. We plant it in the right place uh, with the right care through our backyard tree planting program. But we also provide uh, other opportunities such as stewardship events that people can engage in and also educational programs such as this one. So this event tonight uh, was made possible with the support from the City of Richmond Hill, Ontario Power Generation, and Grand Trees Climate Solutions. The goal of this virtual tree tour uh, includes learning about some of the natural and cultural history of the area around Lake Wilcox, uh, to inspire people's curiosity about the trees around them, with a focus on the species that people can find in Lake Wilcox Park, which is located in Richmond Hill, and of course, how these tree species support biodiversity as well. We also want to teach people how to identify some of their leafy neighbors and encourage people to plant some native species on their properties. But last but not least, we also encourage everyone to have fun. So before diving into the event, I want to take a moment to reflect on my relationship with the land and encourage you to do the same. So people hold immense power in being able to shape the land uh, and this, the impacts that we have, whether they're good or they're bad, they alter the reality of living things and of course uh, of the people as well. And these impacts can linger around for a very long time afterwards. So in reflecting on the relationship that I have with the land, I want to acknowledge that the City of Toronto, where I'm hosting this event from, is situated on the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Trees, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. For thousands of years, this land has been home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, we recognize the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples and recognize their role as stewards of this land. I invite you to visit uh, native land .ca to learn about what territories or treaties cover your city. As someone who lives on and is supported by the land, I'm immensely grateful for everything that it does to nurture and sustain not just me, but you and all the other living things around us, both within and outside of the city. We all have a responsibility to look after the land uh, while we're here for generations to come. So as we learn about the history of Lake Wilcox, some of the native trees that can be found there and how they support biodiversity in the area, I encourage you to take a moment and reflect on what you can do to promote harmony with the land and other living things. And really just to support and enrich the life that's around us. So thank you for holding that moment with me. And I hope that you're inspired to become ambassadors and protectors of native biodiversity. Now I'd love to introduce you all to our guest speaker for this evening, Aileen Barclay. Whether she's speaking on forests, sustainable gardening, or photography or <laughs> photographing uh, birds or developing strategic programming from behind the desk, Aileen loves an opportunity to share her passion for the outdoors with others. To complement her university education over and over two decades of work in ecology, Aileen has 
extensive experience with market research, social psychology, behavior change, and community-based social marketing. As the owner of Resource Management Strategies, Inc., Aileen works with uh, many Southern Ontario's largest municipalities, including Toronto, York Region, Halton Region, and the region uh, of Waterloo, as well as the city of Guelph, Niagara Region, and Peel Region on public education, outreach programming for conservation-based initiatives as well. Aileen has spent the past seven years with York Region's Nature's Classroom Program as their forest education specialist, and is also the program manager with the Oak Ridge's Moraine Land Trust. She's an avid birder as well, and a level two Ontario naturalist. So Aileen, welcome to this uh, evening, and thank you so much for uh, joining us. So whenever you're ready, I welcome you to uh, take the mic away. All right, thank you. For anyone doing the math, I started when I was nine. <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna get going on our virtual tour. Just need to get this started. Okay, um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me great. Uh, because most of the people don't have their video on or their mic, I'm going to assume that you're all enthralled with everything I'm saying and that all my jokes you guys are killing yourselves laughing at, okay? Um, <laughs> it's, it is very odd to, I, I've done been doing presentations for my whole career, and it's part of it is reading your audience. And so when you do these, you have no idea if people are going, huh? Or, oh yeah, or what is she talking about? Um, so it's... It's a bit like presenting to yourself. So it's a bit odd, but uh, as I said, I'm assuming that you're all gonna be dying of laughter over my jokes. Um, I see a few people I recognize out there, so hello to the people I know, and hello to the people I don't know, and welcome. Um, it, it was a beautiful day out. It's been a beautiful couple of days. Unfortunately, I've been staring at a computer, and I think I've been out for a total of maybe an hour over the last three days. My plan was to go out and actually do some really cool video footage at Lake Wilcox, but I was taken out this weekend with a brutal sinus infection, so um, you're going to have to use your imagination for some of these. Uh, but we're going to look at the trees, so we'll go through here. Um, we're going to look at the history of Lake Wilcox, why trees are awesome, why native trees are awesome-er, uh, which trees would be awesome in your backyard, and some design and ideas and tips, and then how to look after your trees. Um, because just planting a tree, people sometimes get a little intimidated. So we'll talk kind of ways to make it really look fabulous in your backyard so that you're hopefully more inspired to plant more trees in your backyard. And this is a little, this is a, just behind my house, I have um, some red pines. And this is a little teeny chipping sparrow baby coming out looking for his dad. Um, so one of the reasons trees are awesome is to get cute things in them. Okay, so uh, the creation of Lake Wilcox. This is, it's on the Oak Ridges Moraine, and it's what's called a kettle lake. And it's basically kind of like a glacier puddle. I'm trying to keep it very simple here. It's leftover ice from the chunks that fell off as the, the retreating glaciers were, were going backwards. Um, the ice kind of fell off, but there was, you know, when we picture a, a glacier, if anyone's ever been to one, it, it's very clean. There are, sometimes they're almost crystal blue. This is a bit dirty, this one, because you're, as it's expanding, it's scraping up the dirt. And as it's retreating, it's leaving all kinds of dirt. So these chunks would break off and they get covered in dirt. So they didn't um, melt or evaporate like some of the other ice waters did. And there was a lot of it. Oh, I'm getting some weird feedback here on someone's mic, I think. Oh, okay, it's gone. Um, so I was trying to find a really great graphic to show you guys to kind of explain how kettle lakes were made. It's a very unique form. Um, they're not a very common lake. They're not typical of the lakes that we have up north. Uh, so here's my technical drawing for you guys, and hopefully it doesn't like blow your mind. Um, you can kind of see that this is before, <laughs> and the glaciers retreated, and they covered all of Ontario, most of Canada. Um, and this is kind of that big ice chunk that fell and it left a dent and then it got covered up with muck and melted and there it is. 
Uh, and then after we have the wonderful uh, Lake Wilcox, which is one of the many Kettle Lakes. Um, other ones you might recognize are Musselman's, uh, Preston Lake. Um, well, there's so many of them. Um, and you, you probably recognize them. Basically anything along that moraine that runs from east to west, that's the lake is probably gonna be a kettle lake. There's even little teeny ones that are almost like ponds that are actually a kettle lake. Um, so my art aside, there's a better drawing. I did find one. So this kind of shows you that the big mess that was left behind. So this big mus mess was what we now call the moraine. So the moraine is kind of was, so you know when you shovel your driveway all winter long, winter's coming, um, and then it melts in the spring and you get that kind of pile of rocks and debris and all that that's on your lawn. That's kind of, kind of what happened with the moraine, but on a much bigger scale. And so we're on a pile of snow dirt. <laughs> and in there are these kettle lakes. So this would be the snow dirt. Um, and then these are the, the little chunks that fell off and left these wonderful kettle lakes. Um, maybe not a pretty start, but a beautiful finish. Um, I just got some pictures of the kind of creatures you find out there. Uh, beavers, which not everyone likes, but they are the na best nature's engineers that you can find. Um, my office is out of the Cawthorn Mulock Nature Reserve. And luckily over the shutdown, these beavers moved in and it is incredible the change they've done. This was an online dammed stream, but they, they took it out years ago. It, the life around this pond is incredible. So, you know, beavers, yeah, they might chop down some of our beloved trees, but they help a lot of other trees and they're just incredible. We've got a little belted kingfisher, and then we have things like frogs and our turtles. Right now, sadly, every one of our species of turtles in Ontario is now listed as a species at risk. They really need our help. And I saw Pat Richards was in the crowd and uh, her granddaughter helped make a turtle protection nest and we were able to save a nest, which turned out to be a test nest, but um, you can do little protectings for them um, because they, they really do need our help. And if you're lucky, the babies are starting to emerge and they're teeny little things. So watch where you're stepping and if you can help them out, move them over a, a, a road or something in the direction they're going, that'd be great. But that's a whole other topic. So let's go to the people perspective of Lake Wilcox. So, you know, back in time, we figured out how it was made and it would have been covered in forests. Most, pretty much all of Southern Ontario would have been covered in forest, lakes, a few grasslands, uh, a few alvars, a few wetland swamps, but generally the majority of the area would be covered in woods. However, back in the 19th swing and 20s, all these lakes that were up here, so Musselman's Lake was one, they were the hot spots. They were like the Muskokas and then some. They had dance halls, they had parties. So you can see in this picture that just, it was just the place to be. Uh, and it was a lot closer than Muskokas, but at the time when you didn't really have the fast cars and the highways, this was a jaunt. So it was very popular. And then as things started to expand in the 50s, you started to see housing around the area. And it kind of slowed down. And then it popped up again in the 80s and kept going. Uh, and then in the 2000s, if, I don't know if anyone in the group remembers this, um, there was the big stop, stop um, development on the Oak Ridges Marine. And it was a community kind of uprising saying, enough, we need our green, this is our, our, our rain barrel, it feeds, you know, the, the Oak Ridges Marine feeds our streams, it feeds our drinking water, it's green space, it's trees. And it got attention. And so a lot of the development was stopped, and this led to the development of the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan, which is still an act today, and it um, falls within the green belt as well. And what it does is it kind of breaks up the whole marine into different designations and what can and cannot be done on it. So you have your natural core, your natural linkage. Those are kind of very, like very well protected, very, very limited development. You have your settlement areas, which are, yeah, we can develop here because there's existing. Um, and then we have our countryside, which is kind of farm and agriculture. So thankfully, people speaking up and saying, hey, stop cutting down our trees and ruining our lovely moraine, um, it, it led to protection. So, you know, you can speak up and, and make change. So I, I tried really hard to get onto a government website to find really old pictures and, and some really cool stuff to show you way back. Uh, apparently they didn't have cameras back in the glacier period, but they did here. 
Um, and so we have these two aerial images of Lake Wilcox. So there was lots of trees, then there was less trees, then there was almost no trees, and now we have more. And I'll show you a close up of what I mean. So 2002, not that long ago, this is just as the conservation plan was kind of coming into action. Um, if we look at this circle area, not a lot of houses, but there was a lot of farm fields. And if we fast forward to 2013, look at all the trees that have grown in. That's pretty awesome. It's very rare that in this area, you can fast forward 11 years and see more trees than there was. Usually it's more houses. You can see there are, is some development down at the bottom and there has been some additional ones since in the last seven years. Um, it was weird that I couldn't find a, a more recent one on Google. I, I think I must have missed something. Um, but the point is, is that we've taken away the trees, we've added trees and that makes a huge difference. And when you have the houses, it's hard to get rid of the houses. So add trees in the house. Um, you know, people often, when I have visitors before COVID that would come, they'd say, oh, flying in, I can't believe how green Toronto is. The ravines, the backyard trees, the green corridors, the parks that have the tree coverage, they do make a difference. So, you know, even if you just have it, I have a teeny little backyard, it's actually a little crowded right now, I need a bigger yard. Um, I'm gonna start planting, trying to rogue plant the little schoolyard behind me and hope they don't get rid of it. Um, you can plant little trees. If you have a big yard, you can plant bigger trees. So what I'm gonna go through is um, look at some of the trees that are featured on the Lake Wilcox tour. Some of the ones that I think would be awesome in the backyard. I was limited to eight trees, so it was really hard. But we're gonna go through that. We're gonna look at little trees, big trees, what works, what would work in your yard. Okay, so why are trees awesome? I am sure everybody in the crowd knows why they're awesome, but I'm just going to um, add to that, hopefully, or at least reassure what you already know. Um, shade and wind breaks, awesome. On a hot day, you don't want to be out in the pavement, you want to be under a tree. Um, when you have those heavy storm events, I've been out in the forest, and it's raining and raining, and it takes about 15 minutes before it starts to actually hit the forest floor. So I know I have 50 minutes to get out of there because it diffuses that heavy rain and then it slowly drips off the trees over hours. So the rain will stop, but it'll still be raining from drips in the forest for an hour or two afterwards. So it really breaks up those heavy rains that we're seeing. Um, obviously it improves our air, helps clean our water. <coughs> Excuse me. Cool story. If you haven't heard of the emerald ash borer, it's, it's a horrible disease. It's wiping out ash. Um, but it, one of the York Region forests, they were going to clear out these ash because they're a high risk hazard tree uh, to fall on people. And they were going to plant understory planting. They took out this really nice, it was sad, but this area of very mature ash. And then they went back to plant and realized that this kind of wet soil that the ash were in, because the ash were gone, the water was released. It was now standing water. It was a, like a, a wetland. And before, what, there was not even water, it was just kind of damp soil. So these trees hold so much water in them, and they're really important in that cycle. Um, and doing that with the roots and, and everything they do, and the, there's um, really neat studies on the, what are they called, bio, biocommunication, I think it is, and it's how the trees and the fungi talk and interact and work together. It's really awesome stuff. So those trees are, are really, People say you can't see the forest for the trees. I say you can't see the trees for the forest, but at the same time, they kind of both work because um, the forest is, is a whole system. It's not independent trees. They all work together and it's just fascinating new science. Um, when I went to school, this wasn't there. Again, I'm dating myself, <laughs> um, but this, this is new science and it's, it's fascinating. Um, having a tree will increase your value of your house by a lot. That's an incredible. Having a tree, Line street ups the value. I had a gorgeous, the trees on my street were beautiful. They were about this big now, gorgeous ash trees. They were all ash, 103 ash gone. So our street was just getting to the point where the crowns were starting to go over the road and you're driving and you're like, I'm in a movie. They're gone because of the emerald ash borer. But it really shows what a difference those trees can make in your real estate value and how you feel about your community. Um, it, it diffuses urban noises. 
Um, it makes traffic seem less stressful. Same with bird calls, which use the trees. Um, you get better mental and physical health just being around trees for a multitude of reasons. Again, that's a whole other com conversation. Um, reduction in crime in, when well-treated areas, like just having trees, uh, I don't know, people just don't want to commit crimes. It's, it's a weird connection, but it's there and it's been researched and studied. And trees are awesome because it gives you a chance, they outlive us, it gives you a chance to leave your legacy in a good way. And it's also homes for owls. So here's a cute little barred owl in a nice sugar maple. Uh, trees are awesome, even the trees think so. So why are native trees awesome? Uh, they provide habitat for so much. Uh, beneficial insects, birds, mammals, us, and to, to a way, they, um, and moths. Moths are really cool. They're butterflies of the night. I used to hate moths, and then I started learning about them. And, you know, people, oh, something's eating my tree. But that moth that's eating your tree is evolved, if it's native. And that moth will then go on to feed something like a nighthawk or a screech owl. And if we look at a lot of our insectivore populations, especially with birds, they're plummeting because we're getting rid of all these bugs that we don't like, and that's what feeds them. So moths are really cool in diversity. They're a very important part of the food cycle, and they are pollinators, and they're part of that, that whole cycle. Again, everything's connected, except for invasive species. <laughs> Just throws everything out of whack. Um, when you use native plants or trees, it's shocking how well nature responds. It's like they know and they're looking for it. Um, you know that old movie, if you build it, they'll come. If you plant it, they will come. Um, I'm, when I first graduated, I, I, I saved up all my money and I went and spent $200 on native plants, which was a lot for a recent graduate. And I planted them in my garden and I was so excited. And then I went out a couple weeks later and something had chewed all of just my native plants. Oh, I was devastated. They didn't get, they bounced back by the end of the season. Couldn't even tell. They were like, nah, we're used to this chewing. I was, I was like, this is amazing. Native plants are wonderful. So nature knows and they work together. They're not really going to cause harm. But obviously, whatever ate it was so desperate for them <laughs> that they were like, oh, thank God, something good to eat. But again, it was like a blink. It, it, they were back in weeks. It was amazing. They're adapted to the local conditions. And trees are the architecture of your garden. So I'm gonna talk about that as we kind of move through a bit more with the design perspective of it, is what, what I mean by the architecture of your garden. It's probably apparent, but we're gonna just build on it a bit. All right, so I just wanna talk about moths as biodiversity because I think they're very underappreciated. They're those stupid things that fly at you at night and you know, when you're going out near a light. These are just some pictures I took around my backyard, and my backyard is maybe 30 feet by 30 feet, it's not very big. And look at the diversity of moths. When you start looking at them, it's incredible. There are thousands of different species of moths. These are so important to our system, like that whole natural world. So butterflies, everyone's like, oh, let's build the butterflies, but moths are something we should be looking at too. They're butterflies of the night. Um, and they're very important and they're a lot, I find they're a lot stronger linked with tree species than some of the butterflies, which tend to be more with the, uh, the plants as host plants. So a lot of these are, uh, they need those native plants as part of their life cycle. So sometimes you gotta love what the icky, icky bugs are, or when you look close, they're quite beautiful and neat. Even more awesome, yes, there's still more. <laughs> So all native trees provide some value, if not multitudes of value. For us, for biodiversity, some are better in yards than others. Not every tree is meant to be a backyard tree. It's meant to be in the forest. Some are incredible in your backyard. Um, some will grow a lot faster than others. And that can be a good or a bad thing. When a tree grows really fast, it tends to have a softer wood and be more prone to breaking off. A nice slow growing tree is kind of setting in that hard wood and it, it tends to be a, um, a firmer, stronger, longer lasting trees. That makes sense. So we can kind of look at some of the things that love trees, baby owls, chipmunks. Um, people get worried about red squirrels. They're nipping off the buds of the trees or this one is on a maple and it was 
chewing and, and just getting the sap to run and then licking the sugar. And oh no, they're, they're chewing the tree. The tree was fine. They can take it. They've adapted with these guys. Um, right now, you'll, if you go out in the forest, if you find any oaks, you'll find the tips of, with a whole pile of branches and a cluster of acorns scattered around the floor. So what these guys do is instead of running acorns up and down, up and down, they go up and they nip off the tips of the trees and drop the whole pile of acorns down and do the tree, come down, pick them all up and store them. So they're very efficient. It's like pruning for the tree. The tree's okay. And if it's not for that, their acorns wouldn't get planted or hidden by the squirrels and their babies wouldn't grow. Uh, they say squirrels forget about 50% of their acorns. I'm a firm believer that they don't forget. They're strategically investing in the future, and so should we. So there's always that, that correlation with things. So it's okay if you're nipping off the buds of your trees. If they're a native species, and in, like both, then it's usually a good thing. Uh, not everyone loves raccoons, but this is a really cute picture of cavities and why they're used so well. So... Um, I think, oop, before I go to that, we are going to do a poll, and Lamb was going to um, get that going. So we're going to ask you what your favorite tree is, now that I've told you how awesome they are. We should have some, like, Jeopardy music. <laughs> oh, I know. Ooh, look at this. Oh, look, wow. This is cool to watch. They're all very fast. We got a lot of, we're at 95 last time I saw. 91, great crowd. Oh, look, the oaks, maples, and conifers, they're like. <laughs> Let's say just about 10 more seconds for everyone to get their vote in. All right. So I'm, I'm not monitoring the chat. So Liam, if you see any, like anything you want to pop up out of the chat, like I'm getting feedback or something, just cut in and let me know. And maples win. Woohoo! All right. I'd say that if any tree won. <laughs> They're all great. All right. So as we go through this, I will say this. This is my favorite tree. And I'll probably say that about all of them. I do the same thing with birds, mammals, plants, everything. I, I really do think nature's fascinating. There's a few I'm not cool with. Swans, yeah, they look all pretty and calm, scare the bejesus out of me. Oh man, those things are evil. But generally I love everything. So I'll say that this is my favorite tree and this is my favorite tree and this is an awesome tree um, because they all are truly great. All right, so the first one. Oh, I love this tree, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, the service berries are, such a popular tree. There's many different species. We're going to look at the Algany or smooth service berry and I'm they're really sometimes really hard to tell apart and I'm gonna say I can't remember if the one I have in my backyard is actually this one but it is a service berry and this is the picture. Um, so let's pretend it's this exact species. <laughs> um, so these ones are absolutely for season interest and what I mean by that is you have something like say tulips. They are great for about two weeks and then they're just meh. You want something that is in your garden that works for its space. Not all of us have massive gardens. Um, and so everything that's in your garden and your space that you're loving and looking after and enjoying and appreciating it, it better work for it. And so it better not just work for two weeks. It's got to be long. It's got to be a couple seasons minimum. And trees, luckily, they all do that. Some do it better than the others. This one, it's got a lovely white pinkish flowers in the spring and it's just stunning. The architecture, it's multi-stemmed, beautiful gray bark. Um, there's flowers, there's berries, and then it's a fabulous color in the fall. It needs all, it's awesome all year round. So yes, it deserves to be in your garden. It, it earned its spot. Unfortunately, bunnies like it. Um, I've been gardening since I was about, well, wouldn't call it gardening. I was trying to figure it out when I was 17, but I've been gardening since. And this is the first year that I've had actual damage, full on damage from a bunny in my backyard. It ain't things bunnies aren't supposed to eat. I think it got somehow trapped in my backyard with the snow. And my lovely service berry, which was just starting to get awesome, is now totally pruned back. However, it's growing back and it'll, it, it'll be back in no time. So it's just a little slowdown in it. Um, however, it still looks great. 
The flower is very important for pollinators in the spring. And of course, when you have the bugs, then you have the things that eat the bugs and then the bigger things. So again, it's that whole food chain, that whole wraparound ecosystem, very, very important. And down here is a orchard oriole on a service berry. So they get out about 10 meters in height. Um, height will vary depending on how happy they are. How fast they get to that height will also depend. So um, there's one of the forests out here and there's a big hill, very sandy soil, but the trees at the bottom of the hill are almost as tall as the trees at the top of the hill because they get all the nutrients and rain coming down. So they have grown a lot faster. But generally you can kind of estimate an, an average top height for things. Um, for identifying, alternate leaves. So the way I often explain this, and I, I can't get up and do this in front of the camera like I would in person, is that alternate is your arm and your leg. They're not across. Opposite is arms. So they're directly across from each other. And then alternate, if you can see my legs up. So they're not straight across. And that's kind of the first ID feature you want to look at when you're going retreat. Um, a, a very small serrated edge with a pointed tip. Um, Multi-stem, the older stems are smooth and great. The stems alone are fantastic feature. Um, when they flower, the leaves are really neat because they're kind of half open, like they're folded and they're a neat reddish color. So not only do you get the fabulous flowers, you get this really cool reddish kind of V-shaped leaf that is almost like a backdrop to those flowers. So this, this one just is incredible. Um, tends to be darker leaves above and lighter underneath. When you get into the individual species, I think that alone is again another webinar and I don't think I'm equipped to teach that yet. <laughs> um, it, it, there's a lot of very intricate details in the different service berries. So, um, but that's what tags are for at the garden center or if you're getting something from LEAF as you can actually read and they'll give you the specific species. Uh, design ideas and placement. So the one at the top, like what an ugly spot for it to be, but doesn't it all, like it just stands on its own. This is at Courtright, um, and it, it was a dreary day, and you know, it's surrounded by wood and concrete, but man, did this thing show. You can see, the, really get an idea, this is kind of your, your mature peak height service berry. You can get a really good picture at that multi-stem architecture, that the stunning flowers, that kind of pink glow as the little leaf buds start to come out. Um, so even though it's not in the prettiest of areas, boy, does it stand out. Um, and then down below is kind of more in the garden setting. Um, so when I talk about the different parts of a tree, when you're looking at your garden, it's kind of like your house. So your trees are your walls, your shrubs are your furniture, and then your, your plants and decorations are your, your pillows and your um, pictures and your little trinkets. If you have too many pillows, too many trinkets, it gets a little busy. If you don't have walls, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, and not having furniture and just having, say, pillows and walls would be weird. So when you're building your garden, you kind of have to look at it like you're building your house. Walls, furniture, and then a few tasteful accents. Um, when it comes to garden design, you and I, everyone here, probably aren't wearing the same outfit. We probably don't like everybody else's outfit. We all have different tastes. So there's no right or wrong to what you add to your garden. If you like it, fantastic. But there are some core kind of design tips that will help you build a balanced looking garden. The, the type of furniture you buy and the type of pillows that you add, that's your decision. And we all have different tastes. If you're happy, that's great. But keep those kind of core fundamentals of, of trees, shrubs, and then accents in there. Um, I once went to a visit. This lady was so mad. And I, I had to go in as the manager and talk her down. And um, she had a bath, a claw bathtub in the middle of her her garden. And I was thinking, oh my God, why would someone do this? She loved it. She wasn't sure. And she had this Japanese maple. So part, part joking. I said, well, why don't you make the Japanese maple at the end? So it looks like a shower. Oh my gosh. And I, and I almost laughed and thank God she got excited before I could laugh and let her know I was kidding. She was like, this is a great idea. By the end of it, she was hugging me. She was giving, this is pre COVID. You could hug people. Um, she was giving, trying to give me gifts. This is the, oh my God. So what I thought was kind of a bit of a smart aleck comment, she thought was the best design idea ever. 
and, and wrote the local counselor about how great things were. And I thought, wow, I'm glad I didn't laugh too soon after that one. So it is personal taste, but again, there are some core things. So back to the service berry. Um, this is definitely a focus point. It isn't a backdrop, it isn't that architecture. It's your, your awesome chair that you got or your fantastic new couch that is just, oh, I just love it, I looked everywhere. This is your focus area. Um, you can underplant it, but when you have that fabulous summer bloom, you don't wanna get too busy underneath. It's its own show, don't distract from it. However, in the summer, it's probably the, one of the less dazzly time for this plant. So it's okay to add that kind of competitive other things underneath that will make up for the lack of pizzazz going on up above. But it is its own feature. It acts as a mini tree, which is great for backyards like mine where I can't have a giant tree. Well, I'm trying, but we'll see how that goes. Hopefully I'll be dead by the time it's really big. Um, but it's great for little yards because it, it has that kind of cool shape and behaves almost like a tree. All right. So our next one, um, Service berry is something you want a bit more sun, part sun. This one is for shade. So if you have a shady backyard, um, this is a great tree. It, it also will grow in a part sun. Uh, another four seasons of interest, pagoda or alternate leaf dogwood. So for ID, it's alternate leaf, very straightforward. Easy one to remember. Um, flowers again for pollinators. The berries right now are out and the birds are all over them. Um, it's architecture. When you go out into the forest, you'll see it growing, growing in a mature sugar maple deciduous tree type forest. So they're very happy in that heavy, heavy shade. Um, really a fabulous plant. When it's in the sun, it, I find it it's doesn't get the right architecture. It's a bit more bushier. Um, and then in more shade, it tends to get more of that striated kind of level look to it, which is both of them are fabulous. Uh, yeah, I'll show you. Well, you can see right here, you can see the berries and then the lovely flowers. And wow, it's gorgeous with these little balls of white tough flowers. Incredible plant. Uh, but four to six meters in height, so a little bit smaller, but I saw some today that might be a bit bigger. Alternate leaves and stems. So it's got a very smooth leaf edge, so you don't have that serration, that kind of little teeny teeth. Not quite a full tooth, but little jagged edges. It's a smooth one. Um, and at the end, you can kind of see it looks like it's clustered at the end. And that's a tilt. So it doesn't just have like a terminal leaf at the end. It, it, they kind of get all crowded at the end because I guess they're excited about being there. Um, what I find is the, the easiest way to spot this is that the leaves are so deeply veined. So you can see from a distance, you can see these lines in them. And that really pops in these plants. So next time you're out in a forest or near a park or if you go to do the Lake Willisox tour, which hopefully you will because the weather is supposed to be awesome, um, you'll be able to see this one because it's just got these amazing deep cool veins, which is part of the attraction for this one. Down below, uh, again, make, taking pictures is great, but you can never really capture the essence like when you're in person. But you can kind of see the layering that happens with this tree, which is part of the really neat architecture, is that it's almost got floors on it as it goes up. And that's in the shade. Again, if you're in a sunnier area, it'll be a bit bushier. But when it gets mature and it's in a shady area, you get this really cool layering. And it, that's where it got the name Pagoda from. It's, it's a really neat tree that way. Um, here's another view of it. Um, and the flowers and kind of as a backdrop. And again, you can see that deep veins in the leaves. Um, it can be a garden feature or it can be part of that level in the garden. So if you have a, a tall tree and then you have something tall next to it and it's just vertical like that, it doesn't always look natural. Um, it looks squished. So when you're designing your garden, you kind of want to be tall and wide um, for not the super tall trees because you'd need a giant garden. But in a smaller garden, you almost wouldn't be almost as wide as you are tall. So it's kind of got that cascading out look to it. So it's not jarred and squished. If you want a more contemporary or modern look, you can do that and make it more linear, but use repetition, if that makes sense. So if you want, if you have, if you want that kind of formal, modern look, repetition, and you can get away with that upright look. But if you want a garden that's a bit more balanced, you want to have height and width. 
this is one that kind of adds. So you've got your taller tree here, then your medium one, and then your little decorations and, and plants down here, if that, hopefully that makes sense. But it also is it's nice enough to make it a feature tree in a smaller backyard and make it your, your awesome middle backyard tree. Um, again, great to be underplanted in the summer because the blooms are over. So when the leaves are just green, you have something awesome underneath and showy and, and fabulous and not competing with that blooms in the spring. Uh, and again, the layering under mature trees, what I talked about to kind of have that flow. Okay, number three, this is my teeny little backyard tree, which I bought seven years when I moved in seven years ago, and it's now about 10 feet over that tree. Um, it's not a true white cedar. It is one of the cultivars because I couldn't find a good backyard picture of a, a never, uh, the, the pure white cedars. Um, but I did want to talk about that. So there are great cultivars. I think the most popular one is the emerald cedar and it's got more of a pyramidal shape. They're never as strong and sturdy as the true species. And this applies for any um, plant cultivars with, in terms of native. Sometimes they will cultivate a plant so it's disease resistant if it's prone to a disease like uh, bergamot with um, mildew, something like that. But generally I find with the trees when they start tweaking them to make them look fabulous or bloom longer or whatever, they're not as durable and strong long term as our native ones that have developed here and haven't been tweaked. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. There's a few exceptions with disease resistance, but generally our true native plants are always the, your best bet. Um, they can go from 12 to 20 meters in height. However, you can also get the little globe cedars, which, um, you know, maybe get about three feet. Uh, mine disappeared under a snowbank all winter long. I was convinced it was dead. Didn't see light for that whole year we had that ice storm. And sure enough, the ice melted and it popped out and went, okay, I'm awake. And no damage. I was shocked. Um, this is definitely winter interest. In any garden, any house, Winter's not always the best time. It's gray, it's dreary. Um, there's no mosquitoes, which is good. But to have that little punch of evergreen color in your garden just, just really makes that nicer thing to look at instead of everything dead and leafless. So having evergreens is a must for your garden. Absolutely. Um, contrary to the myth, they do not breed mosquitoes. I've seen people cut down some of the most beautiful cedar trees. I don't want mosquitoes. No, that's not the case. Yes, mosquitoes will hide out with them, but they'll hide out in grass as well. They'll hide out in any plant material. Where that myth came from is that cedars like to be, uh, they can handle wet feet. They can also handle dry feet. They're, they're pretty drought tolerant considering their origins are usually wet. Um, and so people see cedars and go, oh, there's mosquitoes. They don't realize it's the little pools of water that the mosquitoes are in, not the actual cedars. So they don't breed mosquitoes. They don't harbor them any more than any other plant would. It's just that they're associated in nature with wet areas, which is where mosquitoes breed. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, actually, some of the oils will help repel them. Um, as I said, many cultivars, but native is best. And here is, um, in terms of food, um, this is a little pine siskin, and he's eaten some of the seeds in the spring as he's getting ready to head back up to the boreal forest. Um, my tree, which is, as I said, ginormous now, I, I, I have to start taking some other stuff out of the way, it's crowding everything. Um, there could be 20 birds in there and I just hear the chirps, but I don't see them. Um, sometimes if I'm lucky, I'll see the wiggling because I know there's a little squirrel using it to climb up and, and head out of my garden. Um, but they, they're great shelter in the winter. All right, so, um, it's an evergreen, it's got a flat leaf that looks like a tree. So you can see it up here, it's, the leaves have the shape of a, of a tree. So it's kind of cool, that replicating design of nature. Um, they are shrubby. Um, the bark has got reddish brown, it's kind of like that, it's like a stringy peeling one. Um, it's hard to explain and I couldn't find a good picture, but the older it gets, it tends to get like a stringy, really neat stringy tree. Um, they can be single or multi-stemmed in the wild. They can get quite big, mature. You can probably see them growing all different directions. They're not gonna do that in your backyard because hopefully you're not, backyard's not a swamp. If it is, awesome. Um, hopefully it's not too close to your house, but wetlands are awesome. Um, they, they're typically kind of cone-shaped and the cultivars make them a bit more cone-shaped. 
um, but they tend to be long in, in, what's the word I'm looking for? This is where usually someone in the audience yells out, ah, but you know what I'm talking about, long and oval shaped. Oh. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, like height? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having one of those days where I'm like, you know that word? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and again, there's a little chickadee in them, so they're very happy. Um, okay, so how do you use them in your garden? Again, every garden should have that winter green color. Just cheer us up and, and have that. We just need it. Um, if you want to do hedging, you can make natural walls. Um, you can make natural back, backdrops. You can cover something you don't want to see and not want to look at at any point during the year, like your ugly neighbor's purple fence. Yep, I have one of those. Um, it, it can be a backdrop for more showier plants. It's a nice green color. It can be its own feature. So this is my plant two years ago, my giant tree, and you can see it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, they will grow, they'll grow wide, um, but you can trim them, you can shape them, um, you can hedge them. There's just so much you can do with them. They can be a backdrop, they can be formal. They just, there's a place for a cedar somewhere in your garden. They're, they're just amazing. Um, again, if you want that more formal, kind of modern look, repeated. And then you can even look at like properly hedging them or something like that. There's just so much you can do with these guys. Oop, moved up a bit. Um, okay, next one. We're getting into the more official trees, not kind of the shrubby tree. Um, white birch. It's 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 a beautiful tree. It's to me, it's cottage country and lakeshore. They can go about 15 to 20 meters tall. So we're getting to medium sized trees, not massive yet. We'll get there. Again, you've got your four seasons of interest. So it's a fabulous color in the fall. It's got that beautiful white stem, lovely green against white with the black punches uh, in the bark for spring and summer. Um, it, it's, it's just a, a beautiful tree for sure. Um, catkins. <laughs> Birch pollen is a little heavy and does cause some allergies. I suffer, but it's totally worth it for this one. But the catkins are great sources of food and pollen. Um, this also applies to willows. So not your crack willows and your tree willows, but the native shrub willows. If anyone's got a, a, a like, can set me up with some, I want some for my backyard. Something's getting kicked out for one of those because when they, when those cat comes out and in the birch and the poplar and the, the willows, all the bugs go to them. It's one of the first pollen sources and then all the birds migrating come up. So it's great for spotting all kinds of incredible things. So I really need to get a native um, willow shrub in my backyard. I just can't decide on which one, but I need a source as well. Damn it. All right. Um, when you see the birch, please don't peel the bark. Um, that's not a natural thing for them to be unwind. It ends up turning black and you get these ugly scars. It also can possibly cause injury to, to allow disease or something in. So let it be, let it, it shed its bark. What's really cool is these paper, um, paper birches, the older they get, the more papery they get. That function isn't just to look really cool in your backyard, it's to attract fire. Because when they're getting old, they're saying, okay, I need to be out of here, but I got lots of young, so I'm gonna attract fire which will help clear us old guys out and give a chance for the young ones to come up and renew. So they are, are one that they don't need fire to get going. They need fire to stop and let the next generation come up. So those papery peels that, that get really, they're, they're meant to start fires um, and meant to, to kind of proliferate that species. So it's a really cool adaptation that way. But uh, let's not peel it, okay? And there's a little, uh, I think that was a hairy, or downy woodpecker on that uh, bark. Because they're a softer wood, they, they tend to get good cavities in them and nests. Okay, so ID feature. I think this is the one whenever I'm doing a tour, I say, okay, name a tree, point one out. Everyone says, I know that one, it's a white birch. It's easy. Sometimes they'll point to a poplar, but I'll forgive them. But it, I think one of the more recognizable trees along with maples. Um, again, it's an alternate leaf branch arrangement. They have a double sawtooth leaf. So that's a big one and a little one. Um, oh, we're kind of missing it there. Um, you can kind of see it in this picture. They've got a bigger jagged edge and it's like a big one, little one, big one, little one. 
Um, the catkins are male and female trees, so you have two different ones, and they pollinate by wind, which is what gives us the allergies, because um, anything with a flower pollinates by bugs. So they, they, they say, look at my pretty flower, and the bugs go, ooh, I want some. They come in, the pollen sticks to their feet, they fly to the next flower, bam, plant sex. Um, so they put out that effort for the flower for that, so that pollen tends to not really get stirred up in the air. It's usually stuck to some bumblebee bud or foot or something like that. Um, the catkins, anything long and not showy, they have a long tubular one and they say, well, let's not waste time on flowers, let's just let the wind spread our seeds or, or, uh, or pollen. And so if you think about it right now, and I'm suffering, is if you see the plantain weeds, they have that long, thin, that's to catch the wind and pollinate by wind, that's what's gonna give you allergies. Um, but it's short term, this is a heavier pollen, so it's not gonna stay in the air so much. So you often see it up uh, on the lakes, you'll see like a film of yellow. So it's not that bad. It's worth it, because they're really, really pretty trees. So here's just some design ideas. Again, they're, they're kind of your feature, they're your highlight tree um, because they've got this incredible white bark. And they're great because they have a dappled shade. So they kind of have a cascading branch that kind of flows and they create this nice dappled shade. It's not a heavy, thick shade. Um, it's a tree you wanna sit under. Lighting, one of my favorite things is to see, and I'm not a big, don't overlight your garden because it affects fireflies and fireflies are great, um, is but the right light just highlighting the bark on that tree, it really adds the most amazing element at night to your garden. So if you're someone that likes to spend a lot of time at night in your garden, maybe you're not at home much during the day, this is a great plant to have and then you can do some really neat focused accent lighting and it just, wow, because it that white bark reflects the light and just takes your eyes up and then you have these cascading leaves. Wow, does it ever make an incredible impression in your garden. And it can really brighten up that dreary dark area that you might have. Um, and a little light and all of a sudden, oh my God, my garden's fabulous. Thank you, Amy. Um, okay, so now we're getting bigger into trees. So we've kind of had our, our little ones, our medium ones, and now we're getting into the, oh, we need some space, but man, are these big, awesome trees. This one is the tulip tree. Um, <sighs> They, they're starting to, to replace some of the trees that cut down, and these are some of them. They, oh my God, as you can see, they're awesome blooms. I really use that word a lot, but um, you have to wait for it. So I have trees here that are probably about 10 years old. I'm not gonna see a bloom on them for another five to 10 years. So this is a long-term investment for a fabulous show. Um, if you're just moving into a home and it's your forever home, and you've got space, this is, wow. Um, it likes well-drained soils. It's not going to like its feet wet. It does take full sun. And when those blooms come in, the bees love it. However, apparently they're, bees aren't really good at pollinating. So only about half of the blooms on a tree will get pollinated and actually form into a seed or a fruit. Um, interesting fact. I don't know why they'd put out all that effort if it wasn't that effective. Maybe we'll have to have a chat with the bees. The leaves. This is the key ID feature, I, I don't, I can't think of anything you might mistake this for, maybe a ginkgo, but even then, it's such a cool tree um, leaf. So it's got these four, occasionally six kind of pointed lobes. I can't even think of a word to describe this neat, except that it's a tulip tree leaf. So if I seen something else shaped like this, I would say, oh, it's shaped like a tulip tree leaf. It's just really neat. The cup-shaped flowers, about four to five centimeters, which is a pretty big flower, and wait for it boom check that out imagine an entire tree covered in these like gorgeous tulip shaped orange flashy blooms oh it's worth the wait absolutely so um this is one it's a long-term investment unless you've got a lot of money and you want to buy one of those like already pre-grown ten thousand dollar trees good for you uh it's worth it in my opinion so the trees when we get to these big trees these are what i said the walls of your garden um, they give them room, they're gonna get big. Don't plant them two feet from your house. Don't plant them four feet from your house because their crown is probably gonna be about 10 meters. And you're gonna end up having to cut them and they'll be all weird shaped because they're scratching against your windows or damaging your roof. Always look at the, the maximum size of something when you plant it, not the little size, because they grow and they can cause problems if they're not placed properly. 
and leaf is great because when they come out or they give you the advice um, either in person or if you're doing it yourself they will give you very strict guidelines on how far away things have to be they're not doing it just to be mean and limit your choices they, they know and they're saying trust us on this don't plan it too close trust them on it um, this is great if you have a larger lot and you want a nice sitting area because can you imagine sitting under there on a beautiful spring day with these gorgeous flowers and bees buzzing about not wasps they're jerks bees <laughs> bees are awesome they don't want to bother you but they're buzzing around and there's this beautiful tree with flowers and you're sitting underneath it wow that's something you need forget the garden this is a standalone in my opinion um, it could be a centerpiece in a front yard or it could be part of your big backyard something you want to see if, if you have a couch that looks out that you like to watch TV but look at the garden or you're you know if you're a, someone that likes to cook and look out your window put it somewhere you're gonna see and appreciate it because when it blooms you're not gonna to want to stop looking at it but again give it space all right now we're getting the really big trees this probably should have been last because I think it's the big it is the biggest tree um, this is a conifer evergreen tree. This is our white pine. It is our Ontario's arboreal emblem. Em emblem. <laughs> I've been up since 5 a.m. Forgive me. Hello. Um, <laughs> oh, someone's there. Hi. All right. This oh, is. No, I've got something noise in the background. It's it's oh. off now. All right. It gives me a chance to have a little sip of water. These are the ones that were so big and tall and straight and massive in height that they got cleared out for the Navy. Um, you know, hundreds and thousands of these were completely taken out for the British Navy um, because they were the big masts on ships and they were the perfect tree because they were huge, they were hardwood and they were straight. So they were popular, they were cleared out. It's very hard to find an old growth one of, of these around, they would be about 100 feet plus, 45 meters plus. Um, there was one in Algonquin that stood above and it was about twice the height, it was right along Highway 60, twice the height of all the other trees. Um, and it stood out and that was one they left, not sure why. And unfortunately, because it was out there on its own, it eventually blew over. Um, yeah, these are, they're, when they get that big, they're called super canopy trees. So they kind of go beyond the canopy and they're that super canopy. <laughs> I don't know, really tall canopy, but they're officially known as super canopy trees. And these are very essential for a lot of raptor nesting. That's where you're gonna find um, bald eagle nests, um, owl nests, um, hawk nests, osprey nests, you name it. That's, that's where they wanna be way up high um, and well protected. Um, a fabulous seed source for all kinds of different native species, especially the birds. Um, and you can see here, we have a pine, warbler in a pine tree and he is eating a pine sawfly so see there's a circle um you know these i mentioned earlier about the moths and yeah the flying ones are good but all those caterpillars only about one percent will live of what's laid all the rest are the food and the protein that sustains all those songbirds that come up here in droves every spring feeds their babies before they head back down south so you know they are your insect control and they're really really good at it there's a nice balance. Um, one thing I did, oh, no, it's next, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. Um, so a really, really key feature tree on our landscape and our ecology and just so, so important. How you identify it. So with pines, they'll have these little bunches of needles. So spruce will tend to kind of connect direct to the branch. These will kind of bunch and then attach, so you, and then attach, you kind of pull them off in these little bunches that you can see. Um, white, five letters, needles, five. Pretty straightforward. All the other ones have two, too short, too long, too medium, too twisted, um, but this is the easy one to ID. So it's five needles in a bunch, letter white. This is usually when I look on the ground, pull one up and can't find anyone that has five. There's only four because the other one fell off. <laughs> but trust me, there's five per bunch. They tend to have a nice soft look to them where the red pines are, are long, thick, um, piles of two and they look I find sharper and coarser and I'll show you a comparison in the next slide um, they have a dark bark it's almost black where the red pines more of a pinky orange one this is the iconic group of seven tree the ones that have that wavy leaves so what a tree does is when they're if a branch isn't pulling its own weight in terms of photosynthesis 
it, it, it gets rid of it. So you have to make more than you take up to keep it alive. And if there's too much shade, um, then you're not cutting your weight and they just get rid of it. They slough it off. It's called. So you tend to get them way up above and all the branches branch are really wide up top. And so any group of seven picture, you tend to see those again, super canopy trees in that shape of the mature tree where it's up high and it's invested in its most productive branches and they tend to be off. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, we could do that with our kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Make your bed or you're out. Um, so here, I'm assuming you're all laughing and not going, oh! um, they, they do really well in well-drained soil. So along the moraine where we have all that dirt from the uh, glacier, it tends to be very sandy soil. And when they cleared out the land and dug up whatever topsoil was there and the winds blew and there was sand everywhere, there's very few trees that'll grow in full sun, shade, uh, sand, dry. These guys will, which is why there's so many of them because they were the only thing that could kind of stabilize those soils and, and start creating that forest. Um, they're great for, again, any evergreen blocking unwanted views. Uh, it is a big tree. Don't plant it near a building unless you're moving out next year. And, but I tried that and they cut down the tree. <laughs> so um, <laughs> never ever go back and visit an old garden. It's devastating. Um, but give it room. Know it's going to live to 200 years and get huge and plan for it so it doesn't get cut down at 50 years after all that effort of growing. Um, again, it's a, it's a large lot then. It's not something you put at the corner of your house. Uh, if you have them already, again, that layering, this one is so high up that it's almost a structure. So, whoa. All right. So, oh, there we go. Um, I tried to find great pictures of garden designs around these and all the ones I could find showed the trunk of a tree and this gorgeous shade garden but you couldn't see the tree that was giving the shade. So it tends not to be the, the main feature of a garden, but it would look ridiculous without them. So as, again, they're the walls. They don't, you don't ever see interior design pictures just showing you a wall, but it would look stupid without it. So these tall, magnificent trees, are, they're your walls. You, you need them in your garden and then you build the accents underneath. Um, so finding a great design with a mature white pine is not happening, but I find a lot of trunks with great gardens underneath. So just think along those lines. Um, all right, sugar maple. They are starting to look fabulous. They're probably one of the most impressive ones that we get in our fall color change. Um, not quite as big as the, so, um, the white pine, but still a, a big tree that you have to plan for. It's hard hardwood, so it's going to be slower growth than say something like a silver maple, which will grow fast, but then tends to lose more branches um, but it's it's going to need its space it can take a little it's a little tighter than say the tulip tree um, 10 to 20 meters in height so up till now everything has been alternate leaf arrangement this one is the first one that's opposite yay i know you guys were dying for it um, this is my easy cheat for being pretending to be a botanist and i teach this to the kids i go out with and i say Okay, so there's two trees essentially you'll find in the forest that have opposite branch arrangements. It's maples and ash. There's a few shrubs that have them, horse chestnut, but generally in the average forest around here, you have a choice of ash or maple. So you're walking around with your friends and you look up and you say, hmm, well, that tree's got opposite branch arrangements, so hmm, it's got to be one of the maples or ashes. You look brilliant. All you have to do is remember that one point. If it doesn't have opposite branches, you go, hmm, well, it doesn't have opposite branches, so I'm going to have to rule out a few of the maples, and you can actually list any ones you can think of, and the green ash and white ash. You know, I'll have to get back to you on this. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a great little cheat for uh, tree ID if you're stuck. <laughs> you're all laughing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, maple syrup. Yay! That's just worth it on its own. Um, again, it's, it's an integral part to our forest seed source, host plant. Um, it, it's a key to that mature forest that would have been here a thousand years ago um, that we're starting to see back on the landscape now. It, it's 
it's part of our landscape, literally and figuratively. Very, very important plant, beautiful color, great function, great ecology, great biodiversity. Um, it's definitely something you want in your backyard. How do I ID it besides the opposite branches? It's the iconic maple leaf. So it's one you see on the flag. Not the one you see on the penny. That is actually a mistake and it's a sycamore leaf, <laughs> which is very similar. Um, when you're looking at different maples, there's a way to kind of tell them apart. And how I look at it is that a red maple looks like a chubby silver maple or sugar maple. So it's not, it doesn't have those deep grooves. It looks fatter. Silver maple is skinnier. And then you have the Norway maple, and it looks almost identical. So quick cheat, if you pull off a Norway maple and you break it off at the base, milky sap will come out. If it comes out clear, it's a sugar maple. If it comes out milky, it's a Norway maple. You don't want a Norway maple. People buy red maples. They're not actually our red maple. They're not the lovely red maple that you'll see the color change in the fall. They're usually Crimson King Norway maple. Norway maple, I think, was the first declared invasive species globally. So even Norway's like, no thanks. It's, it's just not one you want. It, it's, it's heavy, it's too much shade, it, it puts its seeds everywhere, it steals everything, the branches come up and then it gets root bound and died. It's the place that goes on those street borders that nothing else will grow. Just don't get one for your garden, <laughs> okay? Sugar maple, much better, much nicer. So much more valuable for our ecology and biodiversity. So when you have a trees, again, they're the wall, they're the, they can be a center point or they can be the backdrop. So here's another example is a lot of great garden pictures that shows the trunk of a tree, but not the tree. It's not a maple, it's just as a, a demonstration. But you can kind of see the layering here of um, the different approaches. A big no-no, look at this. Where are those roots? They're under this patio. Those feeder roots are usually in the top six to 12 inches and you want them out because that's what feeds the tree. So if you cover up around the base of a tree with something hard, heavy, compact, impermeable, you're starving, drowning, crushing those roots that are integral to the tree. People tend to think that what you see up top is what you see down below with roots. There's some cases like that, but for the most part, the drip line, which is basically the width of the tree that it would drip, if, the, if it rains, you're looking at the majority of the feeder roots are again top foot, maybe foot and a half, two feet, depending on the soil. That's what you have to protect. Okay, so that's just my little point about these this under here. So ignore that, pretend it's it's something different. But again, the trees are are your they can be a center point, but the bigger trees tend to be the backdrop, the walls. Um, don't forget the greens of color. So I get I've got shade. How do I get color in my garden? Green's a color. How you, you, it's a very cooling, calming color. So there's color theory ideas. It makes you feel cooler on a hot day. It calms you down. Where a lot of colors can sometimes fire off some senses you don't want. Um, and then different texture can create, and layering can create that dramatic look without having to buy a bunch of patients and water them daily so that you have color. So remember, green's a color. If you have a shady garden, if you have a wonderful sugar maple already, you can layer it just have different textures and different shades of green and you'll get amazing color um, without color, if you know what I mean. And then you can add a few maybe light accents of pots or something just to add color. So uh, green is a color and it's an incredible color. So don't neglect it or ignore it. Oh, I'm going backwards, hold on. Okay, so I don't know how we're doing on time. I could talk forever. Am I over? Oh, shoot, a little bit. Okay, quickly, red oak. Red oak's awesome. Huge acorns are so, so important. We talked about them. The leaves, nesting cavities, they're key in a mature forest. Um, traditional oak leaf, they are the ones with the pointed leaves. The ones with rounded leaves are swamp or burr, or there's a bunch of other ones, but they're the ones with the pointed leaves. So these guys get big, but they're as big as they are wide. So, Here's a nice picture of what not to do in your backyard. Um, yeah, I don't know how you plant a garden around that. This is actually, um, the historic tree was so old that they were thinking of taking down the house, which is pretty incredible. So this is its mature size and shape, plan for it. Okay, general design trip tips. Um, offset tall with wide for a more natural look. I talked about that. Don't overcrowd it, things will grow. 
I do it myself. I pack things in because I don't like bald spots. And then two years later, I'm like, oh God, I've got too much. Um, so if I really need plants, let me know. I have to do a thinning. Um, make it easy to look after. Your garden works for you. You don't work for your garden. You got better things to do. Um, leave things for the winter. You don't have to clean up your garden. Doing that means like leaving the leaves, leaving the stems. That's so, so important for overwintering for pollinators, bugs, all that. Um, don't do too many blooms at one time, have vignettes. So if you have some plants you love that bloom in the spring, bunch them together and that's your spring wow. And then over here's your summer wow. So um, plan your blooms so you don't have too many blooms. It's like having all these different colored pillows that looks a bit weird after a while. Remember, foliage is a feature, so use it. Um, different shapes, different um, leaves, which we've looked at multiple ones here. Um, when you're getting into plants, groups of five, three or five tend to have more wow than single spotted plants, okay? Um, and then we talked about flowers being the decor of your living room. Um, again, foliage is a feature. If you look at the one on the left, and I've taken these from Sean James, who is a fabulous garden designer who really gets nature and incorporates it in the most beautiful way. Um, I highly recommend Sean for anything. He's just a great guy too. I love Sean. Um, so I've stolen his pictures. I told him. Um, so mature trees don't make the design, but the design is not possible without them. Okay. I'm repeating things here. Um, so you're going to complement your trees with some native plants. There's lots of varieties. This is a great, this, I, I bought this one 20 years ago and it's still in publication. It's just being updated. Lorraine Johnson, incredible. Um, consider how much sun and shade you have. What kind of shade do you want? Do you want heavy shade? Do you want dappled shade? Do you want evergreen or deciduous? If it's south facing, deciduous. Blocks the sun in the summer, lets the sun in in the winter. Um, how much sun, just a little breakdown of it, part sun, um, part shade, the different kind of uh, descriptions of what that means in case you're not sure. Uh, looking after investment, watering. Leaf's got some great stuff on their website, not too little. People say, oh, I watered it every day. Well, you drowned your tree, don't do that. Uh, one to two times a week for new trees. Um, and then you're adding, I think your recommendation was three bucks of water. If there's a severe drought, you wanna do a slow trickle in that drip line. Don't flood it, don't dump it, um, but they'll need it and you'll start to see leaf curl. We saw it, started to see it this winter, summer, sorry. Um, mulching, don't volcano. <laughs> um, leave, leave it so you're not crowding that base of the tree. Also, don't bury it too deep in the soil. So I have a little amur maple out front and the top was dying. And Sean was over, my friend, and I said, what's going on here? And he goes, I mean, it's too deep. And he dug about this much soil away from the base. Problem solved. So um, he's good that way. He always teaches me something. Feed your soil. Not with chemicals. Compost is best. If you want to be healthy, you're not going to sustain on just vitamins and popping pills. You're going to want salads and fruits and all those macro micronutrients. That's what you get out of compost. So you're feeding your tree and your plants vegetables and fruits, not pills, okay? Honor the drip line of the tree, which is again, that edge of the outer um, width of the tree. Honor it, don't pave it, don't park on it, don't cover it in heavy rocks, don't dig it up, don't put too much in there. That's the life and the food of the tree. That's how it gets its food and everything, respect it. Prune properly. Sometimes I wanna go and knock on the door and say, okay, we need to talk about how you've done that to the tree. Um, again, it's another whole course. Uh, Sean's got great stuff. Putting properly, there's all kinds of resources out there. Please prune properly or hire someone that can. And appreciate trees' value, um, both ecologically, financially they have value, and respect their world. They're living creatures. They interact with their environment in many amazing ways. So respect that and look after it. Look at this squirrel. He just loves it. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> This guy managed to convince all his neighbors that this is how you prune trees, and there's about five houses. All the trees look like this. It's awful. <laughs> um, don't plant too close together. Don't plant too close to structures. Um, try not to cheap out. It's an investment, says the girl with the $8 slightly wowed iron wood in her backyard that I found on the sales rack. However, <laughs> 
trees are the one thing that I will usually not get in the sale. I will invest in them. They're great. Leaf has some incredible, um, I don't want to say deals, but programs for trees in your backyard. It's wow. I, I think it's awesome. I tell everybody, I'm not just saying this because I'm here today. They really do have an incredible program. Um, don't put the wrong plant, plant in the wrong place. And again, leaf is there to tell you what that is and isn't. And then bad pruning again. Please don't badly prune. Uh, I talked about honoring that drip line. So a picture says a thousand words. I love this picture. I cannot remember where I got it from, but I've had it for about 15 years. And I love to, to include it because wow, does it speak a lot. So you have a new tree plant. Look at the difference. So on the left, you've got roots under trees of a sugar maple. Sugar maple and grass. There's no grass in the forest. On the right, you've got mulch, and wow, what do you think is going to feed a healthier tree? Absolutely the one on the right. Um, so, you know, watch your grass, honor, again, honor that drip line, feed it, mulch it. And as I said, leaf programs, they have a do-it-yourself or a full service. They have consultations. They're starting in spring 2021. They also have shrub kits, uh, garden kits, so you can get designs with it. You can get pollinator kits. You can get shade kits all come together, they give you a design, it can't get any easier or better than that. Um, and pawpaws, which are a big thing, and I believe you're sold out, right? Yeah. So absolutely check out Leaf if you haven't already. I can't say enough about the programs, they're incredible. I wish I had more room. <laughs> okay, so I did it, hopefully I'm in time. Um, thank you, if you wanna email me with any questions, because I kind of flew through the end there and I've given you so much. Um, I'm on Instagram, Nature Girl Aileen. I think that's it. <laughs> Um, and if you're in York Region or close to York Region, um, I started up Facebook groups. It's called York Region Nature. Uh, I think we're at like 1,900 people now, and I, I post, everyone posts about different things, but any kind of upcoming programs, events that I think people will be interested in, um, you can find me there, and um, hopefully we'll see you if you're not already there. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, Lamb. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eileen. At this time, you know, if we were in person, it'd be a round of applause for you, but it'll just have to be a little virtual one. So, round of applause. Thank you so much, Eileen. You have a wealth of knowledge, and it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to hear from you about how to uh, recognize some of our woody neighbors, to awesome garden tips, and even basic air. I also want to thank all of the participants this evening for spending uh, your time with us tonight. I hope that you're inspired to plant native trees um, and will become a steward in your community. Of course, if you're like me, a millennial, where home ownership is becoming next to impossible, uh, I encourage you to just soak in everything from tonight and teach others what you've learned. So this is just a quick little reminder that the trees that have been presented tonight can all be found uh, within Lake Wilcox Park, which is located in Richmond Hill, Ontario. So Leaf has developed a self-guided tour if anyone is interested in visiting. A link will be provided in the chat box, as well as in the description of this video and in the follow-up email as well, which will also include some of the amazing resources that Eileen has spoken to this evening. So thank you again, everybody. 